John chapter 13 and beginning at verse 31. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you should love one another, just as I have loved you you also should love one another. By this everyone will know you, that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of John could be summed up by a number of different key words. It could be called a Gospel of life, a Gospel of light, perhaps a a gospel of believing and a gospel of knowing, a gospel of sending and being sent, a gospel of signs, or above all, as we'll see from our passage, a gospel of glory and of love. Throughout John, the understanding of any key word eventually leads to all the key words they draw meaning from each other, or perhaps more accurately, from their connections to the words and works of Christ. They resist definition, serving more as pointers to Christ. One knows what these words mean to the extent which one knows this incarnate word sent from God into the world. Jesus told Nicodemus, We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. So John 3 verse 11. Later he explicitly connects understanding with his works. Even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So John 30, 10, 37. Life, light, believing, knowing, glory, love. The meanings of these words do not lie in a dictionary. They lie in the actions of Jesus. They describe life and a way of life and they can be known only as experienced in their incarnation. But one cannot talk about the, the glory mentioned in verses 31 to 32 without setting it in the context of the whole of the Gospel of John. The meaning emerges within the story. The glory is inherent in the Son, something he had in God's presence before the world was made. So we're told in chapter 17 and verse 5. And the glory that he brings with him into the world. Those who are his can see that glory, the ultimate outward sign of inward grace and truth. So chapter 1 and verse 14. But at the same time, it is inherent in him, however. It does not reach his fullness until he has completed the work his father sent him to do. Thus, although his glory is revealed to the disciples at Cana in chapter 2, promised to be shown again, following the illness of Lazarus in chapter 11 and promised again to Martha and Lazarus too. In a real sense, only with the arrest, crucifixion and death 
does the hour finally come for him to be glorified? As always in John, this glorification of Father and Son is not something between them alone. It does not stop with Christ. The capacity to glorify God extends to his followers and it's laid upon believers as a charge. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. So believers are empowered to do the same works that Christ did, and even greater works. Whatever works believers ask him to make possible, he will do, so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. So chapter 14 and at verse 12. The Father will not only be glorified in the Son, but also in the community of faith. Our actions show God's glory too. At least we are charged that it will be so. Jesus prayed, All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Here in the midst of this highly theological passage is no sign of Paul's dictum that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here the focus lies on promise and possibilities, looking at the fullness of God's gifts. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. John seventeen twenty two. As was true for Jesus is true for us. We cannot fully show the glory until we have accepted the work God has sent us to do. Or more positively, we show the glory as we complete that work. As stated with regard to glory, one cannot talk about the commandment to love in isolation from the larger story given to us in the Gospel of John. Only in its depiction of Jesus can we see what it means to love one another as Christ has loved us. Now this is crucial since Christ establishes love as a defining characteristic of believers. He does so in verse 35 of our passage for today. All the works mentioned above that show God's glory are at their core works of love. And if we complete no other work, we have done what we are called to do. This work, however, is demanding. It's no mere feeling. It's not simply an emotion, but stands as an enduring, abiding will to do whatever God sends us to do. Jesus states this starkly three times. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those who love me will keep my word. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Love of God and obedience to God become almost synonymous. However, this is not obedience out of a joyless sense of duty or command. This love obedience flows out of communion with Christ. It is who we become 
the more we come to know God. As imperfectly as we might uh, challenge or take upon ourselves this incarnate love, our goal is that love constitutes the essence of who we are and what we do. God will always call on us to love. And if we love as Christ did, that love is strong, it's enduring, that love is faithful. We will love to the end. And this love is not easily shaken or determined from its primary task, which is simply to express itself in action, drawing from God's unlimited supply. Perhaps Jesus' promise in Matthew is better known. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them, Matthew 18.20. But in John, the promise is made more richly. Those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. So this love flows out of his presence among us. When we live in his love, we can, if called upon, Fulfill the highest form of love. There is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. John fifteen thirteen. These are high standards for a high calling. We might look at our friends and wonder if the moment ever came, would we be willing to die for them? There is a, a, an old Orthodox priest on a Greek island in World War II, now memorialised at the Holocaust Museum. One day the Nazis came, demanding that he provide them the next day with a list naming every Jew on his island. The next day he handed them a list containing only one name, his own. He loved them to the end and deemed. We might never be tested to those utmost limits of love, but even if we are not, we are still called to fulfil whatever works of love lie before us. Who knows what these might be? In this passage, Christ's new commandment calls on us to seek them out and to do whatever it is that his love in us asks us to do, not just for the sake of fulfilling a command, but to bring greater glory to the name of the Father and of the Son.